Welcome to another episode of Eric Waite Whiskey Studies, and welcome to 2020. In 2019, I went down to Texas twice and visited distilleries. The first time was in uh, April, and I visited at that time uh, Balcones, uh, Garrison Brothers, Treaty Oak, Iron Root, and the Crowded Barrel. And then in May 2019, I did a whole month of Texas whiskeys, and I had, at the beginning of it, um, Spencer Whalen of the uh, Texas Whiskey Trail and the Texas Whiskey Association on as a guest to give some background information about the organization. But we've had a lot happen in Texas. It's been a really, really exciting year for the Texas whiskey industry and the Texas Whiskey Trail. Uh, but later in 2019, in September, I went back to Texas, spent a whole week there. I was working during the week, but on the weekends, I visited a bunch of distilleries which I will be covering over the next three months from January to March. Uh, I'll be doing basically one distillery per week, plus do a live stream and have a guest on. So whereas in 2019, I had uh, the Texas Whiskey Month. This is a Texas Whiskey Marathon. Really, really looking forward to that. So in 2019, I visited Alamo uh, Distillery, Maverick Distillery. They're closer to San Antonio. Ranger Creek, which is also closer to San Antonio, uh, Rebecca Creek, Andalusia, Ben Milam, which is now Ben Green Milam or Ben Milam Green. Uh, Spencer will correct me, however, get, if I get that wrong. Real Spirits, Still Austin, the, and the Crowded Barrel. And then I also, one of the things about, and, I, and I've said this before, is if you're in Texas and you don't have time to visit a distillery, if, you, if you're in Texas, though, you're passing through whatever, stop at a whiskey shop. Because very few Texas whiskeys are distributed outside of Texas. But if you're passing through, perhaps you're at Dallas, Fort Worth, and you got a couple hour layover or whatever, uh, go hit a local whiskey shop because you're going to find a lot of Texas whiskeys uh, that are not av available outside of Texas. So I was act actually able to pick up a couple more bottles from Balcones, uh, the Hechaceros and the Broharia. Uh, and then I have another bottle from Iron Root Distillery that I picked up during my visit from last year, but I hadn't covered yet. I also picked a bottle uh, at a uh, whiskey shop, um, Withers one from Witherspoon, Whitmire, Firestone, uh, and Robert. Alrighty, so uh, that's so, this is sort of my introduction to the uh, Texas Whiskey Marathon. Now I'm gonna bring on my guest, uh, Spencer Whalen. Spencer, thank you very much for coming on and Happy New Year. Hey, thank you, Eric. Happy New Year to you too. 2020, kind of crazy, right? So um, for those who perhaps didn't cast out the first video in sort of abbreviated form, what we covered before, what are the defining characteristics, I would say, of a certified Texas whiskey? Uh, that's a great question. Um, the, the basics of it are that you, there's five, five basic steps of whiskey making, right? You got mashing, you got fermentation, uh, distillation, maturation, and bottling right? Those things, those things go into the process of making whiskey. And to be a certified Texas whiskey, we just ask that all five of those steps happen in the state of Texas. So that's it. <laughs> so in a nutshell, that's it. So then the next question, of course, is if somebody um, perhaps sourced the spirit from a distillery mm -hmm. outside of Texas, but everything else was matured in Texas, uh, you couldn't call it a certified Texas whiskey. No, it would not be a certified Texas whiskey, um, at least in our current definitions. Now we're having discussions about variations potentially on on certified, but because there are so many categories, obviously of whiskey. But the big thing is is in order for the industry to catch on, the those steps of whiskey making need to happen in the state of Texas because the, those things are beyond just the flavor profiles that happen with doing things in a place. There's also the, the economic side of it, which is like, hey, we're hiring people in the state of Texas. We're hiring distillers. We're hiring those. We're bringing in that brain talent, right. you know, that, that brain trust that's going to come to the state, stay here, plant roots, and, and create an industry. Right. So all of those steps are important. All of those steps are critical to the whiskey making process. So therefore, do them in Texas. And then those products that are made that way are certifiable at this point. So the interest is not just in terms of the whiskey being a reflection of Texas, although you want that, but yeah. also, you know, there is a natural economic interest because uh, that needs to be protected, but also economic interest in 
you want to benefit the economy and a lifestyle of those who are working in the industry within Texas itself. That's exactly correct. And, and you know, it's an industry that's only about 10 to 12 years old. Right. Um, so in Texas, that is obviously. Um, but if you go around the world, the, in, the whiskey industries that have provenance and have a, an established base, they're doing all of those things there, right? right. It's it, it, and the ones that end up importing all their products and doing things, you know, relabeling and and that's again, there's nothing wrong with sourcing. There's absolutely nothing wrong with sourcing. Many of our members source, and all we ask is that you're making at least one product, grain to glass within the state of Texas that's certifiable, right. and then every other product has to be sure. properly labeled, right? So it's it's right. transparency. And from so that's the that's the key word for, from a consumer perspective. We want honesty. We want truth. In fact, uh, I have one of your uh, glasses here, <laughs> by Texas Whiskey. And so yep. those who are watching this, so I'm enjoying, uh, and it's quite powerful. This yes. is Ranger Creek. Uh, they don't call it caliber. It just says .36, but it looks like a 36 caliber. Yes. Strength. And so I visited the distillery, picked this up down there, and I'm at this in a certified Texas Whiskey uh, glass. And it says there, sort of a, the motto is, taste the truth. And as, as a consumer, that's what we, we want. We don't like to be schnookered into thinking we're drinking something that we're not. And I would say, you know, you, so you're saying, so other whiskey industries around the world have similar um, programs or uh, constructions or uh, legal requirements. And I'm hoping, because I'm looking after doing Texas, studying Japan, I'm hoping they get, and I'm, yeah. More, I'm hoping they will say, you know what? Scotland's doing this. Texas is doing this. Other regions around the world are doing it. It benefits them locally. It benefits uh, the identity and character of the whiskey. We need to get our act uh, uh, um, in line too. Because as I'm doing research, there is a lot of, you know, they're blending scotch and they aren't real clear. Hey, this is a blend of Japanese and Canadian and American and Scotland. Some of them are, but some of them aren't. So I'm really hoping is you guys will also, in terms of um, producing Texas whiskey and, and, and protecting the identity and character of it, but also be a good role model to other whiskey industries around the world as well. That That is our hope. I mean, uh, you know, you, you said it right there, the, the taste the truth is the tagline that we decided to go with from the beginning because that this gets very big, right? I mean, we live in a post-truth world, right? <laughs> I mean, we live in a world where, you know, nobody's really sure what truth is. For me, no, what is truth, you know? Right. It's all relative and it's like, no, there, there are certain things that are just true or not, right. right? And this is a little bit of an experiment, both for me professionally, to because I've, I've been in public affairs communications for a very long time, sometimes in politics. And, you know, spin was kind of the, the the term du jour all the time. It's like, how do we spin this? How, it's like, that's a shorthand for lying, right? right? I mean, at the end of the day, that's a shorthand for lying. Now, you can provide context that, so that somebody understands your truth, but that's an educational process. That's not a, a communication spin exercise. So what we're trying to do is trying to teach the consumers of whiskey that this industry that has been rife with misleading claims and pretty much everything since prohibition, which was like, right. I don't care if it's brown and in a bottle that I'm going to call it whiskey, right? <laughs> if we can take this, you know, hundred year tradition of, you know, I mean, we're in the twenties now, right? <laughs> right. And, and the twenties, the twenties right. were, were prohibition. And, and ever since then, the industry has never quite recovered from kind of the acceptable lying of what's in the bottle. Right. And we are, if we can do anything for the global whiskey industry, it's to lead with truth and lead with transparency so that consumers can understand that this is what it means in Texas. This is what it means according to federal code. This is what it means according to international code and, and kind of disambiguate a lot of that confusion that the con consumers tend to have. And the reality is the bourbon world kind of already went through this. Yeah. Uh, a lot of the regulations regarding whiskey were relating the identity of bourbon and Scotland went through it as well. I cover that in my um, uh, notes on the history of Scotch whiskey is what, how do we define whiskey and getting into those uh, definitions? Um, but now Texas is needing to do that as well. So since the last time we spoke, sort of bring us up, uh, get, bring a, an update. 
what uh, oh so I, I follow you on Facebook and so yeah. I can throw the updates there but for those who aren't following uh, the Texas whiskey trail aren't getting the updates what's gone on since the last time we spoke and, and updates in terms of uh, the Texas whiskey trail and so forth so a lot of things um, it, again I, not to rehash the same ground but again there's two organizations the association and the trail um, the associations the parent the trail is the subsidiary and uh, there's legal reasons for that, but the the real reason is that we need to have a consumer facing side and we need to have an industry side. Right. Right. And the industry side, we've been extremely busy and the consumer facing side has been extremely busy. So 2019 was, was a heck of a year for us. It was our first full year of operations. Um, the, the association incorporated in September of 2018. And then a lot of that was formational throughout 2018. And then we, we had our, um, Founding members all joined before the end of 2018. And then in 2019, we grew our membership, both in distilleries and in allied trades. So we now have 19 distilleries that are part of the Texas Whiskey Association. So what did, what did we have the last time we recorded a video? How many did you have then? Man, I've slept too many times since then. I can't remember exactly, but it was somewhere around 15, I think. Uh, so it's 12 to 15. Okay, since then. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. It was, I think the, we originally had... Um, we, we had nine members that were part of the, the founding group when, when we went through incorporating. And then from our first annual meeting that September of 2018 through the end of the year, we added, you know, I think three or four more. Um, and then we launched the trail with 15 members in May Memorial Day weekend of 2019. So and between then and now we added, we had 15 and now we're up to 19. So, and just for clarity, for those who are watching who may not be familiar, Texas is rather large. <laughs> when we say a trail, we're not talking like the Silverado Trail Napa where they're all lined up on one long road. No. <laughs> It'd be nice if it was because you could hit them all very easily. Yes. Uh, but spread all over Texas. And so, and, and Scotland's the same way. They have a, a trail as well, but you're talking about traveling all over Scotland in order to hit them all. Um, yes. so they're spread out all over Texas. So do you have an estimate? So we now have what? You said 14? We, we, we have 15 members of the 2019 trail, and we've just added four more that are going to be part of the 2020 trail. So we have 19 going into 2020. And then we have, uh, throughout the month of January, we'll be adding some some distilleries because we you know have to go through the end of the year, get association membership dues in and everything like that. So in February, we'll lock in the exact 2020 trail. And there may be more than, more than 20 is what we're hoping. Okay, okay. So do you have an estimate of, Okay, let's, I'm just going to pull a round number to make our math easy. Sure. Uh, let's say at the end of February we have 25. Just do you know how sure. many? In order, do you know how many more distilleries in Texas are still left that are not perhaps um, joining the trail, or do you know? Yeah, there. I mean, there, there's several. There's four or five distilleries that are not part of the trail right now that we would love to have them be part of the trail. Um, you know, again, we, we, we as an association, we're representing the entire industry, whether they're members or not, right? Um, because you know, that's what an association is there to do. If we're not doing that, then you're, then you're just a club. Right. And we're not, we're not trying to be a club. We're trying to be inclusive across the board. So, um, you know, there, there are several distilleries that we would love to have join, especially if they join in January, because then they'll officially be part of the 2020 trail. Um, but we'll be adding, and there's distilleries that are, that are being built right now uh, right. that are planning on launching later this year. And, um, and we're, we've talked to a few of them. We have plans to, to work with them. So anybody can join at any time. And w if you join after February, we call you a preview member for the next year. So okay. you can, oh, okay. members can still go and earn points, but they're just not part of the completion sections, okay. you know, because it's hard to print a map every time yeah, you add a new distillery. Changing labels. It comes down to change labels or maps and so forth. So, for example, I visited uh, down near San Antonio uh, or in San Antonio, Alamo Distillery. Yep. They were very much in the process of get, you know get, starting up another location, and I just moved to a new house. And I know how difficult it is to do all kinds of, while you're moving and you got things in boxes and you're you know you know packing and you're yep. unpacking. You know it's a bit of a it's kind of hectic. So you really you can kind of take a breath. I finally moved in, got everything settled in, all the Christmas tree. You know they got all the ornaments up. It's so nice. I my goal was to have everything done before Christmas, and I had it done the weekend before Christmas kind of relax at Christmas vacation. Well, they're in that same sort of situation. Sure. And yet, I'm going to say, as a preview before I do my video, 
they were super hospital hospitable to me. They welcomed me in. Hey, you know, our place is a mess. Sorry, we're getting ready to move, but come check us out anyway. Um, and I, and that's in terms of an attitude of a distillery and the place you want to visit. Yeah, they've definitely already got that. So I'm looking forward to see what they have. And I asked them if they remember the trail at the time, and they said they weren't yet, but they're looking into it. But they're moving, you know. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of things going on. And, and again, we don't want to pressure anybody right. to, to be a part of this. We want them to join on their own terms. Um, but so it's get, not a cult. What's that? It's not a cult. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> Unlike the tribe. Who yeah, is yeah, those guys over in Austin, you know, you got to keep an eye on those guys. <laughs> no, no, we, we, we are, uh, we're, we're trying as hard as we can to be inclusive across the board. And, um, but, but at the same time, have standards. Right. And, and that's, that's the, the big, that's the big thing that we're trying to do more than anything is like say, okay, here's standards that are minimum standards, right? Anytime you create an organization um, that does anything that feels like governance, right? Where you're, you're saying these are standards, this is, you know, we have bylaws, whatever you you're really good at setting floors and ceilings, right? Like any kind of governance organization is really good at floors and ceilings, but the more you get in the, the middle part and be like, yes, but yes, if not this, then this, then you're in, then it gets really sticky. Yeah. So we're trying to set minimum standards and, and say, this is where you need to be. And then if you can join the association, you right. don't have to join the trail right off the bat. There's plenty right. of distilleries that are, cause like I said, it's a young industry. There's plenty of distilleries that are getting their, their production under underway, building their experience out, like literally building tasting rooms and things like that. So not everybody's ready for trail membership to the public, kind of like you were, were saying, like, hey, please come. We'll be as hospitable as we can. But to have a steady flow of tourism, you got to be prepared for that. Right. Right. You don't want to handcuff people with bureaucratic nonsense. Exactly. At the same time, you also want to have a clear identity as to who you are, where you are and, and what's happening as well. That's right. That's right. So, yeah, that's that's our goal is to. To make sure that you know there there are laws and there alcohol alcohol is one of the most regulated things in in the world, right? I mean right. the industry is so regulated in every every way that we want to be like okay well, we're going to uphold the regulations that exist and that's kind of rule number one is follow the law, right? Then go above and beyond that and fire, follow the law to the highest possible interpretation and that's where the transparency comes in, right? Because if you can be transparent while following the law and doing all the things you're supposed to do, then we want to send consumers to experience that right. firsthand. Now, this is sort of parallel to uh, the life of a whiskey tuber in that there is both, there's a social aspect of that's both cooperative and friendly competition. Yeah, uh, absolutely. We don't, we don't compete. We don't compete. It's yeah, kind of yeah. like this. It's kind of like, you know, let's say you were a whiskey tuber and we're playing chess or tennis or whatever else. We get together, we're friends, but I want to beat you in a game of chess or tennis mm -hmm. or golf or whatever else. But at the same time, if you're not that good at playing tennis or, or chess, it doesn't do me any good to play against you because it's too easy. So right. you want – it's a friendly com com competition, rivalry in which you're promoting your rival. Yes. <laughs> you you kind of get that going on there too. I'm inspired by my fellow whiskey tubers who are doing really, really well because I then want to go, oh, I want to be better too. I'm going to up my game. I'm going to improve my channel. I'm going to do this. And so I would say like uh, Jason over at uh, um, Mash and Drum. Yeah. Love, love the brother. Uh, he's To me, he's one of the, the, the better ones who's really up and coming, really growing. He's really good at what he does. And he's one of my favorite people. Uh, but I also go, oh, that's really cool. Oh, that's what, And yet he's doing something different. Yep. So the similar thing is, you know, other particularly wine industries and, and, and over in France, if you're an American, you go visit uh, some chateaus, they'll welcome you in and show you what they're doing, but they won't, they don't want their neighbors to know. Right. <laughs> yeah, there is, yeah, there's just, there is an unfortunate uh, sort of disharmony, a little bit more com competition versus the Napa Valley, which is particularly say when we had the fires the last couple of years, they all jumped in to help each other out. Yes, they're in competition, but, and this is a phrase that gets used a lot, you know, a rising tide raises all ships. Same yep. thing here is um, a friendly competition um, to outdo each other to be, to be better, to make a better whiskey, 
not to bring other people down, but to, to elevate your, yourself and each other as you become a better uh, producer. Uh, but also knowing that, hey, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fly to Napa Valley. I'm not just going to go to one winery. I'm going to go to Texas. I'm not going to just visit one distillery. I'm going to see what else is in the neighborhood and check the others out as well. So yeah. we want people to come as a destination to visit uh, to and, and then the hotels and vacation and, and visit distilleries and bring stuff home. Um, so you need that sort of cooperation on there as well. Yeah. I mean, one of the early analogies that I made when we started talking about the association as an idea, as a concept was uh, two things that Texans are very familiar with. One is football, American football, and another is poker, literally Texas Hold'em poker, right? right? right. Because both in both of those things, there are very distinct rules of how the game is played, and nobody nobody has a special set of rules for that, right? Everybody knows the rules. Po you know, like, like Texas Hold'em poker is one of the most easy games to learn, but the hardest to perfect, right? right? Because everybody knows the rules. It's very simple. But it's all about the nuance of how each player does that. That makes the competition. Right. And whiskey right. is very much the same. If you set those five basic standards of mashing, distillation, I'm sorry, mashing, fermentation, distillation, maturation, and bottling, and say, just do that here. And then notice we're not creating a style with that. We're not, we're not saying that this is this is how rye should taste, or this is how a bourbon, a Texas bourbon should taste, or this is how a Texas single malt should taste or any, there's no definitions of style. It's definitions of process and then let everybody compete on the style. Right. Because right. there's enough innovators in Texas like Jared Hempstead. And, you know, I mean, even, you know, you know, we just got done at uh, giant here with uh, this giant Texas rye. Okay. Oh, sorry. Flip it around. They're doing some amazing things with really large scale, column stills and it's a large scale operation. And then you have like people down the road at MKT that are doing innovative things where they're adding rice into their bourbon mash hmm. and they're doing, cause, cause that's a local grain of the KD region. Okay. So like both organizations, small, large, they're playing by the same rules and competing with each other to see who can create the best juice. And I right. think that's fascinating. And it's a win-win because if, if they all tasted the same, we, as a consumer, we wouldn't, we like, meh. Yeah. And and there's some of that, I don't want to step on, there's another state to the north, which I shall not mention, that yeah. produces bourbons. <laughs> but uh, after a while, and it's, it's sort of a stereotype, but sometimes a weeded bourbon is a weeded bourbon to some extent. I know my bourbon uh, whiskey tubers are going to shake their fist at me or their finger at me or whatever. But yeah. various, one of the things I'm enjoying about Texas is there's, there's more innovation, uh, for example, uh, iron root using yes. uh, different types and varieties of corn to bring different characters and flavors to it. Um, so really, really exciting. Now, have you got any um, insight or, on, and I know maybe this is more of an individual distillery issue, but are there legal issues that have been a problem in distribution or what's anything going on with that? Yeah, I mean, Again, we, we kind of deal with the, the cards that were dealt from the legal perspective. And, and that's, again, another hundred year trend of the three year, three year or three tier system. And and there's laws in Texas that old blue laws that uh, prevent some of the more innovative distribution things that we'd like to do. Um, you know, you're only allowed to buy two bottles per person per 30 days at a distillery. Uh, so there's there's certain limitations around that that are frustrating for sure. Can't buy on a Sunday, which is kind of crazy. Can't buy on Sunday. So Sunday right. sales. You can buy wine. You can buy a cocktail. You can buy beer, but you can't buy a bottle of whiskey. Yeah, and you can also give away as much whiskey at the distillery on Sunday, but you can't sell it. So <laughs> there's some, there's some really odd things in there. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of it's kind of crazy. So um, what do you think in terms? Of, so if, if someone's coming down there for the Texas for the first time. Yeah. Is there any place do you think so because everything's spread out, place is so big, and maybe only got a short period of time, where's a good place to maybe first land and get started? Is so if there's only one distillery away out in Timbuk two, it might be a little challenging to start there. Is there any particular reason, <coughs> excuse me, within Texas that might be a good place to sort of get started and, and start your adventure and in, in, in visiting the trail? Yeah, so so we've broken the trail again. You, you mentioned it, Texas is really large. So um, I think our vision for the trail is while we're at 19 members going into 2020, we'll probably have more than 20 going through the month of January. 
um, is right now we have three sections, North Texas, Hill Country, and Gulf Coast. I'm going to go ahead and break some news here that we're going to add a South Texas region. Okay. And where would, that be near? what would that be near? We kind of centered in San Antonio and then regions south of that, okay. right? But not along the Gulf Coast because it's not just the clusters of where distilleries exist is where we're creating them. We obviously are, but we're also trying to create the uh, more terroir based regions, right. right? Because Texas is so big, the climates are so different. The Gulf Coast breeze coming into that region all along that really long Texas coast um, is going to create a different whiskey than it is up north is in the hill country and South Texas, which is more arid towards the Mexico border. It's just different, right? So if I recall correctly, and I'm scratching my brain, if I recall distillery culture of the ocean, as they age, they will actually reduce in ABV. Is that correct? That is correct. They, they will actually. The ones, as they get it, they'll actually increase in ABV. And the distinction is how much uh, water they're losing during the aging process. So that's at least one distinction uh, between the two different regions. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a huge one for the Gulf Coast that makes it very unique is that it's so humid and so usually high pressure there along the coast of, you know, you're getting the, the Gulf of Mexico moisture pushing in that it will actually increase the water in the barrel because it's so humid. So you're actually proof down a little bit over time. And everywhere else in Texas, the heat reduces the the water in the barrel. So your ABV goes up and your angel share is pretty massive. Right. So now most people know that, you know, in order for something to be called a uh, bourbon, it has to be at least 51% uh, um, um, a new oak. Uh, oh, excuse me, 51% corn. It has right. to be new, new oak. Um, is it charred new oak? It doesn't have to necessarily be American, although most are uh, American. Charred new oak container. Right, right, right. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, are there any definitions? And I've heard Daniel over at the, the Crowded Barrel talk about this. I guess there's still a little going on about defining American single malt. Even if the United States doesn't have a definition of single malt, is there anything going towards Texas as a defining character of how do we define single malt? Um, it's something we're talking about, but um, we haven't made any definitions. Again, we haven't made any definitions on style at this point. That may right. be something that, that we that we talk about soon. But um, I mean, you know, if we were to follow the Scotch whiskey single malt definition of three years minimum, you know, in, in a refill barrel in, you know, almost they call it first fill, but it's actually the second fill. Right. Um, but uh, if we were to follow that definition, then a lot of the, the single malts coming out of Texas would be way over oaked because it would, the, the heat would just extract so much. Right out of it that, and you've seen, you've, I'm sure you've tasted some of them. Um, the, the amount of time, I mean, for example, this is the Balcones single malt that we did as a trailblazer official okay. awesome. blend. Um, this is 24 months and you can see the color on that single malt, right? So that's two years in Texas. Right. So we, we have to, um, be, be flexible and provide that ability for, for people to innovate. Now, the single malt definition internationally has been established that it's one single distillery, right? And and then following, you know, 100% malt, malted barley or something like that. There is no American definition of single malt, right. so people tend to mark towards the Scottish style. Right. Now, if we create a malt definition that is similar to single malt in Texas, then that'll be a different discussion. But it won't for for now. We're, we're letting the American Scot Scotch uh, whiskey or single malt uh, society kind of work on on that because that's a very specific style based thing, and we're trying to be focused more on the industry and allowing for the multiple different varieties of style. So you would also need um, I would see to follow that is you would need also a definition of a blended malt because and I've been right now I'm studying Japan. I'm already. Yeah done all that stuff for Texas. Now I'm already thinking that during Japan, you can have a Japanese blended malt. Now in Scotland, that just means two different Scotch distilleries, right? Uh, it could be two Island distilleries, two Highland, whatever else. Um, but in Japan, that could mean that other distillery is in Canada is in Scotland. So you might think, Oh, it's two different Japanese distilleries. Nope. That's not this blended malt is not the same thing in Japan as it is in, in, in Scotland. So but there any, because we mentioned single malt, 
Have you met any thought? And I know maybe I'm getting ahead of, ahead of things. You know, other de- single grain uh, blended malts uh, and those sub definitions as well. So a um, couple things there. One is when you start talking about definitions, then you're getting into TTB territory, right? Oh. So there, there are definitions of blended whiskey, um, American blended whiskey that are TTB definitions. Okay. So some of those words are, are already codified. Oh, okay. Right. Um, and the one thing we want to make sure that we're not doing is putting some kind of a label or certification on the bottle that is in any way conflictive with what the TTB is saying for those particular terms. Right. At least, at least not before uh, Texas secedes from the union, right? <laughs> yeah, that'll be a different story altogether. <laughs> then we can do whatever we want. Um, yeah. Okay. No. Uh, but for now, for now to be, you know, uh, just to be clear about it, it's like, okay, we have the laws that are in place. How can we um, expand clarity in the consumer? Because if you just read TTB definitions, there's like probably 10 people in the world that really, truly understand the TTB definitions as well as anybody, right? That's not, our goal is not necessarily to change that at this point. There may be things we disagree with as an association down the road and things we may push for. But for now, our focus is how do we, how do we clarify things for the consumer and educate the consumer about what it means to be a Texas whiskey, what these different categories are, why innovation is important, what are all the different um, uh, grains and styles that go into the products that are coming out of Texas. And if that then leads the industry down a path of transparency, then then we've accomplished something. Right. So just for the viewers who, who may not know, TTB is not the Texas uh, tax. Sorry. So yeah. just for that, you know, I always have to keep in mind. So yeah, you're right. Where else, what is the TB, TTB? It's the, it's the uh, Department of Treasury uh, Tax and Trade Bureau. Right. So right. that is, that is where you have to submit all of your labels before any, before any label can say what it is on the bottle, right? This, you know, this has bourbon whiskey on it. It has to meet the definition and under, penalty of perjury, you have to say, these are the steps that we use to create this whiskey and this is the definition of it and it files for a class type. So all of those things, and that's that's a taxing organization, right? They, you know, they're making sure that it's the Tax and Trade Bureau. They're making sure that these labels are right for the consumer, but also right for taxing so that they can, they can assess everything. Which used to be part of the BATF, which was a Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms. And I believe it still is. Um, okay, it's just a subcategory. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Or oh. I don't know if it's the. It's not part of the ATF, but it's part of okay. Department of Treasury. <laughs> oh, they just throw in pizza or barbecue. You know, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Farms, Pizza, and Barbecue. Right? Yeah. Why not? <laughs> right. Just make it a cool guy-focused YouTube channel. It right. sounds like. So a very long time ago, I actually worked with BATF, uh, yeah. but not in the alcohol department. So yeah. okay. So let's say. I'm new to this. I've never heard of this before. Uh, you know, there's a lot of talk, you know, on whiskey tuber land about, about we have our own land now. It's an amusement. Yeah, park. I know it's weird. We have our own amusement park. Uh, <laughs> um, I hear there's a lot of talk about Texas whiskey. So, because uh, you're a Texan, so how is Texas whiskey like? If you can sort of generalize, how is it generally different or distinct? You think from uh, other types of American whiskeys or Scottish whiskey. Is there anything you think sort of stands out or really says this is Texas? Yeah. So um, stylistically, I'm going to say there's absolutely no Texas style. Like I, I, a lot of people will say because historically they've looked at, you know, again, only 10 or 12 years worth of, of whiskey to look at here. But people are like, okay, there's a lot of oak flavor. And yes, the heat absolutely does something to add more oak flavor quicker. A lot of barrel note, a lot of spiciness, um, a lot of full bodied flavors. Um, so I, those things are all kind of typical right now in the conversation of what Texas whiskey is. But I, I having done nothing for the past two years other than really sample every Texas whiskey I can try, uh, I'm telling you, there is no particular style. It is, right. it is absolutely unique. And, you know, like the University of Texas, their tagline is where Texas, you know, you know, they, it's where Texas, what starts here changes the world. Right. And that's UT's tagline. And it's, that's a very Texas thing. It's like, we're, te- it's different because we're Texas. 
Right. <laughs> it's, sorry. You know, we like us some us. And because it's coming from here, you're going to have something different. But I think you're going to have something different in almost every bottle you try. Okay. But you, but wouldn't you say then, though, that there are reflective distinctions in different regions? For example, like Garrison yes. Brothers, when I, when I visited Garrison Brothers, this I've done for many years in the wine industry. I travel somewhere. I roll down my window. Of course, we have nice weather here in California. Yes, you do. Uh, <laughs> other than when it's, uh, you know, on fire. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so I roll down the window and I take a whiff of what's outside. Yes. And I like to see, can I find some aspect of this uh, in wines? Uh, if there's a lot of eucalyptus, sometimes you can pick up a little eucalyptus in the Cabernet or whatever. Um, but when I went to say Garrison Brothers and I did that, I rolled down the window, even though it was, you know, 100 degrees outside and I could smell uh, the trees, the brush, everything else from. And maybe this is completely psychological, but I pick up a hint of the terroir of yep. Garrison Brothers uh, in their whiskeys. So not in terms of a regulated style of Texas whiskeys, there can be and it may take a little bit more perception and visiting the place to see the correlation, uh, but there seem to be um, some distinctiveness in regions within Texas that are distinctive of that particular region to some extent. There, there, look, there's no doubt that the climate is going to make a massive difference because there's several climatological regions of Texas that just make, they're going to make whiskey that's different. In right. the north where Iron Root is, where, you know, you can have snow and ice on the ground because it's right near the Oklahoma border. Those cold fronts don't make them, those cold fronts stall out in the hill country and they don't make their way to the Gulf coast usually. So, um, and in the hill country, it, it'll, we'll get that cold front. It'll push through and then it'll stall out and the Gulf coast moisture will push it back. So you have these days of high heat and humidity, Gulf coast moisture, then 50 degree swing, cold, dry, arid. Right. Like that. So that happens in the hill country, North Texas is going to get more of those cold fronts. All of those things are going to change the variability of how the whiskey is interacting with the wood. And there's no doubt that the region is going to have a, a thumbprint in and of itself. Right. Um, but, you know, I, I kind of liken it a bit to uh, Scotland. Right. A lot of people, when they say I don't like scotch. They are talking about. I don't like PD scotch because that's what they had, right? Because that was this most, um, that was the, the flavor note that stuck out the most to people who tried a scotch for the first time. And then they think that all scotch is the same, but you know, as well as anybody that you go to a, get a good Highland malt, that's going to be completely different from an Isla malt. It's going to be completely different from a Campbelltown. Like there's all the different regions are making different styles. And oftentimes people are playing with the idea of I'm going to try to make an Isla here in, in the Highlands, right. right. And, or, or, or do some of those styles. So it really has to do more with the people that are making the product that, and their processes, you know, Ironwood's doing Elevage. They're trying to make is they're trying to buy time in the barrel. Right. They're trying to go longer right. in Texas, which is hard. Right. 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 And, you know, if you go to, to Balcones and you try, you know, a really robust Froke release, their French Oak release, um, and compare that to a Mirador, which I'm assuming you've had a Mirador at this point. No, I haven't. I haven't. Haven't had. Okay. A, I haven't had Froke either. Okay. Well, you're gonna have to get both of those. Yeah. But um, but those, you know, one's gonna be really tannic, old world. Another one's gonna be really fruity, light, you know, delicate. Um, and I think you know the people that are trying to make the delicate flavors in the Texas climate. And like, that's the innovation that's really right. exciting to me. So in like, I, of course I'm a wine psalm, so I'm always bringing in wine analogies, but in the wine world and sometimes throughout the year, you have to make adjustments because you know, there can be some variation. Uh, a lot of those changes are made through canopy management. You know, how much sunshine and exposure you get is going to change um, you know, the development of the grapes. So out in the Central Valley, you basically see a bush and you can't see the grapes in the middle of summer because they're hiding because it's yeah. hotter out there. Versus Napa Valley, they have what's called vertical shoot positioning where the the, the, the leaves are basically folded up like this and you yep. can see the grapes. And, you know, dun, 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 there we are, you know. 
Yep. So in a similar way, Texas has to find ways of mitigating um, too rapid aging, similar to the way the vineyards have to mitigate through canopy management too fast of ripening, you know, because they can get burnt, they can get dried out, then you have all these other issues. So in some ways in production in Texas, Texas has to do something similar to sort of counterbalance some of the, those, those features there. Yeah, um, a good example is a, a gentleman named Herman Key, who was at Gulf Coast Distillers, now opened up his own package store. Um, he had a great analogy, uh, you know, working for years in wine and whiskey, is that in, in Texas, the, I'm quoting him exactly here, the, in Texas, the barrel really is like the vine. Right. Like each individual barrel is going to be um, like the vine. Are you doing 30 gallon? Are you doing 53 gallon? Are you doing a 60 gallon? Um, are you doing elevage? Are you not? Is it going to be stacked vertically in the warehouse? Is it going to be stacked horizontally? Are you going to, how many tiers are you going to have? Because, you know, in Kentucky, you can have many different floors inside your barrel warehouse. Do you want to do that in Texas? Because it can get to 150 degrees up at the top. Right. You know, you know, do you want to get that hot or do you want right. to be more flat and level? There's so many different ways. And I've, I think we're in that experimental phase right now where everybody's trying to figure out what's the proper maturation environment. Right. And, but you know, we're, we're, there's also growing distilleries. So they're figuring it out. Right. They're figuring out where they're, where, what facilities they have and what they can do with it. And they're also moving facilities. So I'm very interested to see what's going to come of it, but it's going to take a generation, this first generation to figure that out. So I'm kind of curious is a possible option, um, you know, a wine, like a, like a cave or cellar in Napa Valley, you have hillside and you can bore into the side of a hill. Um, maybe in Texas, you don't have those hills available, but maybe you can go down into something, build a cave that would, because once you get certain depth under underground, uh, the, Temperature fluctuations sort of decrease a little bit, but that might too much. I know I'm just speculating might yeah. decrease the intensity and rapid aging that you actually want to some degree. I don't know. Well, it, it, and again, that that varies on the the geography of Texas. So if you do this in the hill country, there are natural caves, um, but you also have to build in a lot of ventilation because they're still going to get you know, they're still going to get really hot, but right, right. is that share kaboom, you know? Yeah, right. exactly. Um, but you know, it's also a, all limestone in the hill right. country. Right. Oh, right. Yeah. Like really hard, you know, caliche soil, limestone base. And you go into North Texas, it's all black lands, like right. black clay, high rich soil that you can't, there's no basements in North, North Texas and really anywhere in Texas because the ground shifts and the foundations move. So, but what is interesting is uh, this bottle right here. So this, I, I showed it already, but this little blue top, this is uh, Ghost Hill, Texas. And if you look at it closely, it says aged underground. Okay. Oh, this is what so, they put the whole barrel underground. Yep. They just, they took two barrels and uh, they, you know, the same distillate, aged them above ground and then buried a couple barrels underground, six feet under, just put the dirt on top of it. Right. Wow. Completely different flavor profile. Wow. Total experiment. And it was in, very interesting. And I, I think like this is a bourbon, but it came out tasting more malty for, for whatever reason. So right. we're figuring it out. But that's, I think, the most fun thing is that it's all experimentation and innovation. And that's going to be the defining characteristic of Texas whiskey. So one of the things I hear from, from viewers on um, when I start talking Texas whiskey, people are like, uh, I want one, but I can't get one. You know, that's sort of the issue. Is there anything that consumers can do other than smuggling them out? And, you know, um, we, we sometimes we like to send each other um, samples of, you know, Tabasco sauce, you know, yes. uh, wink, wink, nod, nod. But is there anything that we can do legally to maybe encourage either from a legal side or on a business side, we can approach our local whiskey shops. For example, I just moved here to Roseville. There's a place here locally called um, uh, Bourbon Wines and More. It's a very small shop. And I, first thing I did, I went in there and I started talking about Texas whiskeys. I'm just yeah. sort of a natural evangelist for Texas. Yeah. Um, Thank you, by the way. So they had, so they had a Garrison. They had some Garrison Brothers, and I think that was it from Texas. So I'm actually going to bring a bottle or two over there just for them to try. Hey, yep. you know, here, try this, try this, try this, and then consider carrying some. Um, but is there anything in terms of that the we as a consumers can do 
can we you think go to either distributors or markets over else to encourage uh, whiskeys come Texas whiskeys coming to our to our state? Yes, uh, by far the biggest thing that people can do is talk to their local retail, whether it's a bar bar restaurant or liquor store. Tell them I want this product in. Period in the story because if they get enough of that, they're going to push it back up to the distributor. I, you know, and then the distributor is going to either meet their customer's demand or not. And so it, at the end of the day, it's very, you know, <laughs> very, you know, consumer based, very uh, capitalist at the, in that regard is, is what can the consumers do to show that there's demand. And um, it, which is why I think if I bring a couple bottles in um, and they taste it, if they're impressed and they like it, they go, you know what? I think my, I think my, my customers would really like this then they might be willing to give it a go as well. Yeah. And, and look, it's going to be just like anything else. I mean, uh, you know, when people want to get BTAC products or sorry, Buffalo Trace Antique Collection products, you know, there's a buzz around it. Everybody wait, people are waiting in line in front of liquor stores. They're doing things like that because those products have kind of broken through the clutter and said, these are, these are going to be the tip of the spear to get these types of bourbons into stores. And um, I would say that there are several Texas products right now that can be that tip of the spear, whether it's Garrison, Balcones, Treaty Oak. I mean, some of these things that are, you know, Ranger Creek that you have right there in front of you that when, when people try them, they're like, OK, this is not a bourbon like I'm used to. This is something right. completely different. The only way to get it is to try it. So uh, the first thing I would say is come to Texas and take do the trail take some bottles back with you. You're allowed to take them on a plane, you know, so take some bottles back with you, spread the gospel of Texas. You, with you. In your luggage. you can't bring them on board in the cabin. No, no, no. You can, clear. you can, you can pack them in a, in a bag and, and your luggage. as I ran into this, you can only have five liters per bag. Yeah. So if you order five liters, you need more luggage. Yeah. So you can bring back as many once, but you're going to be paying for extra luggage just because yeah. I've been there, done that. So just let people know about that. Yeah. So the good news, the good news is, is I think because of our aging climate down here, um, we can meet demand in quicker order. Like it's not going to take 10 years for us to get another release out. Right. right? It's going to take two to four years or, you know, in the most high end five years for if we start today trying to meet demand, it's going to, it's going to grow. And I, I, all of our distilleries are growing and trying right. to project that demand out right now. So the biggest thing I would say is talk to your local shop. Because that's still the tip of the spear as far as getting liquor into people's hands. Right. Talk to your local shop. Let them put the pressure up. We may be doing stuff down that down the road on that, but we have the same issue here in Texas. I mean, Texas is a huge distribution market, right? Um, there's a really interesting documentary uh, on on uh, Double and Dr Pepper and how they had to have a fight over a 24 mile you distribution the, region. The Devil and Dr Pepper. Dublin, Dr. Pepper. Oh, they said the devil and Dr. Pepper. It sounds like no. a great French country song. The devil went down to dog, drink some Dr. Pepper. <laughs> you know, it's like, well, I haven't heard that one. Yeah. No, uh, Dublin, Dr. Pepper, uh, it's the it's the little town that had their, they, they used real cane, cane sugar as part of the Dr. Pepper recipe. And then when Dr. Pepper corporate went to um, high fructose corn syrup, they stayed with that. So there was this, but they had this containment area of 24 miles for their distribution. And people within Texas would co would go into that region and smuggle it out so that other people could get Dublin Dr. Pepper all throughout Texas. There's a great story about it. So it's a little bit similar where we have to kind of recruit our own state to get the distribution to all the stores and to have them distinguish Texas whiskey on the shelves so that it's, you know, it's not just thrown in there with the bourbons and the other American whiskeys, that it's a distinct and, and, and unique thing. So we have to do that here. And then nationally, people can just say, Hey, I want this, right? Let, uh, let, let people know that you want this product and it, it will come. I'd say one particular tr ch chain, perhaps people could approach. So a lot of times if I'm going online, I'm looking up Texas whiskeys. I go, Oh, total wine and has total wine and more has it. And it's, Oh, but not in California. Right. I have seen, I have seen Balcona's uh, lineup. You have like one or two bottles. Now I'm seeing like five or six and I'm seeing uh, the Harbinger from uh, Iron Root, but yeah. And I don't know about the inner workings of Total Wine and More, but maybe that would be even a good place to start. Go to local time, Total Total Wine and More, or <coughs> contact the corporate office. Say, hey, I noticed you carry this Texas whiskey in Texas. We would love to see it here in California. 
Because it may be t- if Total Wine says, oh, people outside of Texas want to drink it. Let's see if we can ship it out of ship it out and get it to other stores in California or Idaho or what, whatever states are also out there as well. Yeah. And, and I will also say from an association standpoint, if you're a, a retail establishment, um, you could become part of the Texas Whiskey Association to support the industry, get yourself in front of the, the distillers, learn more about their products. What's up? Get, and get yourself a t-shirt. Absolutely. And a we, have, we have new ones coming for 2020. So yeah, we'll have to get you some of those. Um, so, yeah, anyway, go ahead. Coming up to the top of the hour, been almost for an hour. Uh, I went to Texas twice this year. I might be back in 2020. It'll be in summertime when it's oh. mighty hot and ripe. But I should be in the – if I do, it'll be in the Austin area. So uh, if you're in the neighborhood, uh, I'd love to see you again uh, and meet up again in perhaps in July 2020. But I'll uh, I'll keep you informed. So we're at the top of the hour. So uh, where can people find more information about the Texas Whiskey uh, Trail? So uh- – Two things. One, I'm going to I'm going to first point you to TexasWhiskey.org to kind of finish the thought on um, on products, because every product that is a certified Texas whiskey, um, you'll see this either as a sticker. Mm-hmm. Sorry, let me get that on there so you can see it. But you'll see this as a sticker or you'll see it as starting to be printed on bottles. And we have if you go to TexasWhiskey.org slash certification, you can see or there's another one, texaswhiskey.org slash certified dash Texas desk whiskey. And it has a list of every product that is certified. So if you're saying, Hey, I want to find a particular product, go to that resource online. And then you can point people to that, send them the link. You'll see the, why it's certified and, and where it falls into classification so that people know exactly the product skew that they're looking for. Right. So that's, that's one thing that you can do um, today for the trail. It's texaswhiskeytrail.com. And uh, here we are, like first week of January. In sometime here in the next couple of weeks, like I said, we're we're still working with a couple of distilleries to bring them on. Um, we'll be releasing the new trail map, and we'll be releasing the new uh, tiers of membership. You you said it was a, a big state, and that's why we sell memberships to the trail, so that you can just buy a membership, get free tours throughout the state. You're in points, and if you're a trailblazer, which is our top tier, then you get access to all these uh, distinct bottles like the Trailblazer official selections that we do um, and exclusive events, master blending classes, all sorts of things that we're going to be doing. Uh, so we'll really be a free level of membership and Trailblazers that, uh, and then you'll be able to buy passes to go throughout the trail and just take tours if you're a visitor from out of town. But, so that's what's coming forward. We're going to find you. Where can they find you on say social media? Uh, Texas Whiskey Trail and Texas Whiskey Org on Facebook and Facebook and Twitter for the org, Instagram and Facebook for um, for the trail. Texas so Whiskey trail. Updates, you know, when a new distillery gets added, um, when there's events going on, when people are posting uh, photos and stuff going on down in Texas, if you follow them on Facebook, like like I do, uh, yeah. you can be a little bit more uh, up to date with what's going on. Um, and the holidays are very much involved as well. Yes. Um, so I'm hoping to have uh, uh, them on my channel for, for a future video uh, during this Texas Whiskey Marathon. Hey, I want to thank you very much for coming on. Really enjoyed the conversation. The hour just flew by. It does, uh, always. I learned, I learned a lot, and I'm really excited. I love Texas whiskey. I don't love Texas weather. <laughs> <laughs> Well, if you if, the only time the, the times that you've come have been in the dead middle of summer, and that's basically our winter, yeah. right? Uh, that's that's when we stay in cars and air conditioning. So come come during this time of year, and it's fantastic because if you don't like the weather, wait around for a second. I think it dropped thirty degrees today. Right. So right. Uh, it's all we get six months of really good weather and three months of really bad weather, and then there's a few months in between. So yeah, we'll fix good whis- whiskey. Yep, that's right. All right. So all right, thanks for coming on, and uh, cheers. Cheers to you. Thank you so much, Eric. We appreciate it. Hey, if you like my review, be sure to check out these other whiskey videos. 